Good morning, everyone. I mean, uh, for coming to the first of the two um, panel discussions that we're going to have this morning about the Chinese film industry, um, making films in China for the China market and beyond. And the topic for the first uh, panel would be uh, the title is Getting the Green Lights, Developing Films for the China Market and Designing Efficient Structures. And today, um, we are very much honored to have um, three uh, very important figures in the Chinese film industry and three speakers from three lands bringing us three perspectives about film production in China. So um, maybe I shall begin by introducing our uh, speakers, um, beginning from um, the speaker sitting closest to me. Um, she is a graduate in computer studies in the UK, but she returned to the home city, her home city of Hong Kong for, um, to work in television and public relations before embarking on a very successful career as a producer for uh, companies such as Cinema City, Media Asia, but most importantly, Film Workshop, uh, co-founded by, um, um, she co-founded with uh, her husband, the director, Choi Hak. Uh, it's a collaboration which yielded a long line of hits, and most recently being the Detective D film series and Flying Sword Dragon Gates. Uh, she's also the founder of Distribution Workshop, um, the recent hit being Bands, which premiered at Cannes in May. And she also facilitated the Hong Kong directors crossing over to China, mainland China, and also mainland Chinese directors crossing over to the International Film Festival circuit. And she's also the ambassador for Screen Singapore this year, Ms. Nelson Shi. And on this next speaker, um, she's the founder of Desen International Media and has attained commercial and critical success in the past few years with the Tiny Times and Ip Man series in China. Honored as, a, as the pioneer producer of the year by Chinese entertainment consultant firm N Group in 2010, uh, this is an award uh, marking her successful spell leading major Chinese film companies such as Beijing Time and Tales Media Group and Stella Media. Uh, we welcome Anne Shofen, please. 大家早上好. And then our third speaker, um, you've met her before. Uh, she arrived in China in 1979 as one of the first batch of US students to study in the country after the normalization of US-China relations and also after the opening up of the country. And she speaks Chinese as if it's her mother tongue. And also Japanese, of course. <laughs> A lawyer by training, she has since established herself as one of the leading lights in the Chinese film industry with her role as Hollywood's first China-based executive to her current role as president and CEO of Village Roadshow Entertainment Group Asia the company behind uh, the hits this year, Journey to the West, a man of Tai Chi. Uh, please welcome uh, Ellen Elisov. Ellen. Okay, um, to maybe to kick off our discussion, before we go to the future, maybe we'll just travel a little bit into the past. Um, I'm just wondering whether you can share with us whether there are any milestone moments that you, which is very memorable for you, in terms of like, these are the aha moments which mark the, the changes or the seismic shifts of the Chinese film industry for the past like 10 or 20 years, maybe next. Good morning. Working now? Oh, good. So the aha moment for me, which is very early for me this morning, was very aha just now, because I think Amy gave a very, very good uh, presentation. The figures were mind-boggling, and almost too much to um, try and uh, absorb in, in, a, in such a short time. But there were three things that I noticed, because Ellen said we have to make it lively, so I'm trying to make it lively. <laughs> so she said three, three things which I noticed. One, she said, is the demise of the 3D cinema. And I've been working on 3D cinema in the last few years quite a bit. And um, that's a bit sort of shattering, so I should think about that. And the second thing was that she quoted in her research the, that the audience 
uh, did, uh, the, their taste is that, well, their comment on the type of films being made is that repetitive, boring, whatever. There are two big categories like that. I don't remember the exact wording, but that was the idea. So, of course, within these walls, we can say this, and you and I know that's because a lot of it is because of censorship. It's not by choice. The producers did not choose. But very often, in order to make the film pass, we, you know, I'm sick and tired of making period costume martial arts films, but you know, I know definitely it will pass. Uh, whereas if I try to make a young um, teenage film about teenagers falling in love, definitely it would not pass, because they would say, please go to the education department and get their permission before you make this film, you know? Now, what was the third depressing thing I saw in my aha moment? Now, I've forgotten what it was, anyway. All right, back to our, yeah. I think uh, for me, um, as, a, as a commercial filmmaker who makes commercial films, uh, when I first started making films in China, and the first one which was supposed to be a bit of a landmark, because it was the first martial arts action, very, very commercial film being actually made in China, was in 1991 uh, or 92, which, um, um, which I've subsequently remade, and it's called New Dragon Inn. That was in itself already a remake of a classic King Hu, one of our greatest Chinese filmmakers, one of the first to win an award in Cannes. King Hu made the film in the 60s. Uh, film Workshop remade it in the early 90s. And uh, last year we remade it again into a 3D version. So that was for me one moment because for years I've been making films in Hong Kong and we make them in a certain area which we call the sacred land of the martial arts movies because everybody's there. There's only one tiny bit in Hong Kong which is no longer there anymore. We can just about avoid the cables and the, and the wires and the taxis on the highway further up the hill. Um, we all make our films there. When I made Dragon Inn and we went to um, uh, uh, make it in the um, desert in China, uh, it, it, although I know Chinese geography a little bit, it still overwhelmed me that actually I was living in this history, um, uh, that I was able to actually shoot in the location where we describe instead of this tiny beach in Hong Kong where we've been shooting for over 10 years. The other, I think, moment for me was to realize the potential of the market. I made a film in 2004, which was released in 2005, called Seven Swords, based on a very classic Chinese novel. Um, it was a martial arts, again, martial arts period action film. And um, when the film came into release, it was made for uh, not a very low budget at the time. When the film came into when the film came into release, on the first day we were of course very nervous. And although I tried to understand the Chinese market about how many cinemas there were, screens, and what our um, distribution pattern was, I think the first day my box office was eight million RMB at the time, which to me was like that's the collection of an entire film, an entire run in Hong Kong for a film to run four weeks which I collected in one day, eight million. Um, of course, since then, I'm happy to report that my last film, which was released end of September this year, the first day, the box office was something like 58 million RMB, so, which is, you know, <laughs> aha. <laughs> How about uh, Anne? Can you share with us maybe some of your landmark moments? Um. I've had so many exciting, revelatory aha moments in China because um, when I started working in China, it was as an importer of Hollywood movies uh, when I was working for Warner Brothers. And we understood what the, what the potential was when we saw how audiences were reacting to big commercial movies in China like the Harry Potter movies, the Lord of the Rings movies, the Matrix movies, etc. But what we always hoped um, was that Chinese movies would realize their potential as well and that there would be a great thriving marketplace where imported movies and local movies would coexist harmoniously and that sounds like a government slogan but we really believe that because local language production is, is so important to a lot of the Hollywood studios it may not seem that way, but 
the Hollywood studios do not want to dominate local marketplaces. They want to thrive in local marketplaces. So my two aha moments with Chinese movies um, were where I saw two Chinese films being released at separate times that showed the potential for commercial Chinese movies that were made for the audience. The first one was Zhang Yimou's Hero. And I remember attending the premiere in Beijing and going, this is how it's going to work. There's going to be Chinese capital. There's going to be Chinese stories. There's going to be Chinese creativity, all Chinese language, everybody in it, Chinese to their core, and it's going to be tremendous and epic and huge and people all over the world are going to watch it and that was a huge revelation and the second revelation and I was very pleased to participate in this one was um, when we discovered a young director named Ning Hao who um, had just graduated from Beijing Film Academy and uh, brought us over to his little tiny grubby apartment in Beijing to show us his student movie which was called Mongolian ping pong, which was later released under the title Lü Xiao Di, yeah, Lü Xiao Di. And it was hysterically funny, and we were all in this little room, and he was telling us what the people were saying in the movie because they were speaking Mongolian, so even <laughs> so he was translating to Chinese. But we started working with him because we thought he was brilliant, and um, he brought us the script and then he brought us the finished, uh, near finished movie for uh, of Crazy Stone, which um, actually Andy Lau had had the genius also to discover Ning Hao, and Andy Lau was the person who gave him $500,000 to make Crazy Stone. And we picked it up and released it in China, and it became a breakout hit. And for that time, breakout hit was we were really excited because it made uh, 27 million RMB at the box office, which is like nothing these days. But in those days, it was a big deal. And it was the first movie that had what now has become a very, very popular genre in China, something called jie di qi, which means it's, it's down to earth, it strikes home at the heart, it's, it's really, it's for the people. And it has all sorts of characters, small people, characters, quirky characters that people can relate to, which now has become very, very important in the film industry. And the actors who were in Crazy Stone, like uh, Huang Bo and Xu Zheng, have now become the leading actors in all of the big movies that are so jie di qi, like Lost in Thailand, for example. So it was so exciting to see that there was not only room for gigantic Chinese movies, but there was also room for something really special and really local. And in fact, the development of the industry since that time has proven that that's all very true. Um, Ning Hao's film came out in 2006, and Hero, I think, was 2001 or something, if I can't remember exactly, but much earlier than that. But both of those genres have continued to um, achieve great success in the China market. And maybe you can um, share with us. Ms. Ms. An is going to speak uh, in Chinese, so for those of you who don't understand Chinese, you should put your headphones on. 大家好，我是来自内地中国内地电影人安小芬。呃，应该说，呃，作为一个内地电影人，呃，我可能就是更更加的了解中国电影内地的市场情况。我觉得就是对于这个问题呢，就是应该说中国电影呃经历了有一个
呃，让电影自由地进入市场，让观众来选择电影看，我觉得这个是呃一个最大的中国电影市场最大的一个突破。啊，那么从零二年以后，那么到今天应该说有十年了吧？呃，它以这样的每年高速的一个发展，就比如说从零二年的五亿全国五亿票房，到九亿、十五亿、二十亿、二十五亿，然后四十三亿、呃六十三亿，然后到一百亿，然后一百三十亿、一百七十亿，然后可能到今年的二百二十亿。呃，以这样的一个百分之三十到四十的这个飞速的发展，我觉得这个市场的这种作用功不可没。所以我觉得这个是中国电影一个开天辟地的这样的一个一个里程碑。那么第二个里程碑呢，我觉得是张艺谋的电影《英雄》呃的上映。那么，英雄可以说是他又开启了中国商业大片的一个模式。那以前呢，中国电影都是一些呃文艺小片，而且呢，就是也没有不不会拍商业大片。那么，从零二年的张艺谋的《英雄》开始，呃，让中国观众第一次见到了中国电影。呃，商业大片的模式和和这种视觉震撼，啊、呃，所以呢，就是从此以后呢，就是零二年开始，又开始了呃十年的一个中国电影的一个商业大片的时代。那么中国电影人因为缺少商业类型片的经验，所以跟香港电影合作了十年。那么这十年呢，让。呃，其实这个票房的飞速发展也跟这跟香港电影合作十年的这个商业大片之路密切呃密不可分。呃，那么中国电影就从此多了类型片，多了武侠片、古装片、动作片，然后爱情片、喜剧片，啊、呃，这开始了这样的一个类型片的一个发展。呃，那么呢，这十年以后。我觉得这个到零一到一二年，那么这十年应该说又结束了，就是跟香港电影的这个合作的蜜月期结束了，因为可能是呃供应的类型就是特别的重复和单一以后，让观众又产生了一个视觉疲劳，可能所以从零二年以后，呃一二年去年的一二年。呃，古装片呢、武打片、动作片就全面的，呃，是票房失败。那么说明中国观众的口味又开始发生了变化。那么这是第二个里程碑的一个事件。那么第三个呢，我觉得是《阿凡达》在中国的上映。那那个是零九年。那这个一部电影呢？呃，让中国观众感受了前所未有的这种视觉冲击，呃，他呃可以说创了一个记录，就一部电影在中国整整上映了六个月的时间，就六个月的六个月的档期，这是任何电影没有做到的，呃，所以他创造了十。差不多十三点八亿的票房，到现在还没有打破这个记录。哦，那么从此呢，中国开启开始了，呃，拍摄也好，学习也好，开始了三 D 时代的电影。这个是，呃，中国我觉得是第三个里程碑事件。那么第四个呢，我觉得是从去年年底十二月份开始的，由由那个宁那个徐峥导演的《泰囧》，泰囧电影。呃，打头阵。那么接下来就是，呃，北京遇上西雅图，呃，致我们终将赵薇导演的《致我们终将逝去的青春》，呃，还有陈可辛导演的《中国合伙人》，还有我自己当制片人的《小时代》。呃，这这五部电影接连的在中国创造票房奇迹。呃，它呢都是跟中国观众。呃，非常贴切，就是跟现实相关，呃，可以说是反映反映现实生活和情感的，呃，成本就是制作成本不高的电影。那么它之所以在市场上能够引起，呃，这样的一个票房奇迹，其实我们认为呢，就就是因为。呃，好莱坞影片也好，还是呃十年的香港跟香港电影合拍也好，就是它产生了很强的一个
呃视觉疲劳，所以这样的一个非常贴近现实的一种小清新电影，然后怀旧电影，让观众感觉到了从从。从来没有过的这种亲切和这种，呃，就是抚慰可以抚慰心灵的这样的感受，所以他在今年上半年的整个的中国电影市场爆发，啊，这个也说明了一个趋势，就是我们的观众在不断的变化。呃，我们作为电影人，其实要时刻的去把握观众的动态，把握市场的脉搏，拍出让观众喜闻乐见的电影，才是我们的职责。呃，我觉得就是这四个里程碑是是我理解的中国电影的发展。好，谢谢。Summarize. And who needs a summary in English? Okay, I'll just go really quickly through it because I don't know how many of you are actually using the the simultaneous translation.、Um, <laughs> she said everything in, like much better than I did, but the same sort of point of view in terms of the the milestones.、Um, I mean, the,、uh, the hero milestone. Was really important because it showed, in 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 Miss An's view, it showed the importance and the potential for big Chinese commercially successful movies.、Um, she also mentioned the honeymoon period between mainland China and Hong Kong, where the mainland Chinese film industry was trying to、um, absorb the proficiency, the professionalism, and success of. Genre production that Hong Kong has done so well in terms of developing、um, everything from romantic comedies to thrillers to、uh, police detective stories to epics, and that there was a very close working relationship between Hong Kong and mainland Chinese filmmakers, which of course Nan Sun was very deeply involved in many many of those projects.、Um, For about 10 years, starting from about 2002 to about 2012, and Miss An's view is that sort of the honeymoon has come to a bit of an end now, because、uh, first of all, the Chinese audience、um, now understands the rules of those genres, and Chinese filmmakers are now starting to strike out on their own to find something that you know takes advantage of the proficiencies of filmmaking and all the disciplines of filmmaking which they've learned. Great, in great part, thanks to people like Nansen, but who are now trying to develop things that are uniquely aimed at the mainland Chinese marketplace, the audience there, what they care about, what makes them feel good, what makes them laugh, etc. And、um, that was one of the other points that she mentioned. But the, there were four because the third one was, of course, the release of Avandar.、Um, Am I saying I'm just using the Chinese word <laughs> avatar? <laughs> Wait a minute. Yes, in the marketplace because I'm using the Chinese name.、Um, it's it set a box office record that has never been broken in China, and it really represented a huge challenge in in effect to the Chinese film industry because it was throwing down the gauntlet and saying, "Here's a technical standard of filmmaking that you can aspire to," and you know. You're not that far from it. This is something the Chinese audience will really respond to. You guys followed up by making the first 3D Chinese movie、uh, using, I believe, the stereographer from Avatar. So it, it, it's, it's really it, that was a really powerful moment too.、Um, and the last one, which I think is so exciting, is、um, from the end of last year and carrying through through 2013. There has been a Enormous achievement by Chinese filmmakers in developing the kinds of movies that I refer to as jie di qi, the sort of the small budget, their romantic comedies, their road trip movies, their、um, funny, quirky characters. They're touching. They're lovable. They're warm. They're sentimental. They're nostalgic. They're all of those things. There have been five of those movies just over the last eight months or so that have been huge hits. One was、um, was the Zhao Wei movie、um, So Young, So Young or for, So Young, yeah.、Um, the Peter Chan movie American Dreams in China, the、um, uh, Xue Xiaolu movie 
Finding Mr. Right, Tiny Times, which Miss Ahn produced herself, and Lost in Thailand, if you go back a little bit to just around this time last year. Those movies all did extraordinarily well, and they've established a real sense of momentum and confidence in the China marketplace for those very, very local movies. So I think that was a good summary of what she said. Please. I'd just like to respond to this. Um, uh, the, uh, just a little backstory about the reason why this 202 to 2012, this 10 years, is because actually the government in 20, uh, 2001 and 202 started, they wanted, they had a very strong um, uh, incentive to want to develop a healthy uh, industry which is in, in, in line with the market. That's why there were a lot of policies um, put in place between 01 and 02, and seriously being felt in 03, I think, uh, including allowing, uh, before it was only co-productions were only allowed between um, certain state-owned studios, and there was a quota each year, um, which meant that at the time, about 10 years ago, only 100 films were made, mostly very artistic films, to last year about 800 films were made. All these policies had its effect in different areas of the film industry, including in film distribution, uh, outside parties were allowed to do joint ventures for distribution, cinema ownership, etc. So that has explained why all this, and for those who are not familiar enough with the Chinese industry, that is, ex explains why the tremendous growth in the last 10 years, in terms of cinemas being built, more screens added, number of productions, etc. Um, Ms. Anne said that we have a honeymoon period with the Hong Kong filmmakers. Uh, I would like to say this. I've never thought of myself as anything other than a Chinese filmmaker. I make Chinese language films. And wherever I can make uh, the film that I want to make, in whatever place it is most appropriate, I would go there. Um, I think the last 10 years, because the Hong Kong filmmakers have had some success internationally, we know the uh, rules of the game in, in, in the international arena. So when we first started making films in China, we were very excited because um, there were suddenly available to us many resources. Um, not just financial resources, that, that came later, uh, but, but the natural resources, the uh, human resources, and it was very exciting to us. However, despite the fact I think that the box office is looking so rosy, um, I think the filmmaking in China now is and is one of its most chaotic stages in recent years. As I said just now, 100 films to 800 films in 10 years. You and I know that talent do not grow on trees. So in the beginning, there were a lot of people uh, in the filmmaking business who had some skills, but they were making artistic films. So when Chinese filmmakers who are much better at making commercial films worked in China, we could work with these people and they did have the skills. Um, and so when quickly these number of productions went up, it meant that many people are now um, uh, not as skillful as they should be in their position. You can, I can tell you, you cannot find many qualified ADs, assistant directors, and for anybody who is in production, you would know how important first ADs are. You can never now fill, I can never fill my film with enough qualified people. I can find, if I can find the production designer, thank God, and he can find his art director. Then the two assistant art directors, one is very qualified, has worked with me for over 20 years, the other is not quite ready, but we couldn't find anybody else. So I need two extra people to help this assistant AD who's not as qualified, and he can only find one who's more qualified and one who's less. So he needs another two extra people to help him, and it goes on. That's one aspect of it. The production, many people now who've worked on five big films in the last three years feel they're very experienced. And I don't feel that they are yet as experienced as they should be. But this is a situation we have to learn to deal with. But the other aspect, other than production, is the rest of filmmaking, not necessarily directly related to production, but equally important, which is marketing, financing, accounting, um, international market, deliveries. And all this, I think, is still very, very not ready in China. Um, you know, I think I've, now they're delivering to the cinemas in China, you know, uh, just making deliveries to China. 
But when we do a big film, and you know, I'm very fortunate I've done several rather bigger films, which means I have to deliver in over 20 territories, day date, which means there are many versions of subtitles, possibly censorship changes in different uh, territories, and all this I think is still, I'm just mentioning one area, but you can imagine, Mark, still all the film directors are cutting their own trailers, which I don't think is professional. Um, but that's still how it is, on making their own posters. Um, they should have approval, but they are not the experts at the marketing, I think. And not even mention, you know, financing structures, completion bonds, insurance, etc. So I have really very mixed feelings about China, working in China now. I'm Chinese, I, I work in China, that's fine. I love my, what I do, but I've, sometimes it is so frustrating and so annoying. <laughs> And how I wish it would just become a little more healthier, quicker, you know, sooner. Thank you. So, um, taking up Nancy's point, um, maybe I can, uh, maybe we can sort of discuss um, about the infrastructure, the problems in the infrastructure in the Chinese film industry, about the lack of expertise and how um, assistant directors, for example, after just two or three films, they will be propelled into the directorial stratosphere and there's a shortage of actually junior rank level uh, professionals in every level. <laughs> so how, how can producers actually navigate this um, chaos, as you, as, as you mentioned? <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, we, sometimes we wonder as a foreign company that's investing in Chinese movies and you know develop we actually are developing and producing our own Chinese movies what do we bring to the table but when I actually heard what Nansen said I'm like yeah it's good that we're there because a lot of things that people all over the world take for granted in the film industry do not exist in China and um, First of all, on the, on the crewing, the, the crewing up is so interesting because a lot of filmmakers want to make movies in China because they find that, um, they think that the personnel will be less expensive. But that is so not true because of what Nansan just explained. You know, if you've worked at a studio that has, you know, a multi-decade history, whether it's in Hong Kong or whether it's in Hollywood or even whether it's in Bollywood, you will find two or three generations of the same families working in that studio. When I worked at Warner Brothers, we had four generations of people who did costumes. We had four generations of people who did props. This is a long-term thing. It's not something you can learn overnight and it's not something you can even learn in three years. You, so it's kind of, so, what happens with productions in China is that they superficially look like they're going to be less expensive, but actually they turn out to be more expensive because you inevitably do need to bring people in and that involves a lot of additional costs because you have to find places for them to live and because they have to pay taxes in China and all that sort of stuff. So, so China is not for the faint of heart. It is not for people who think that they're just going to go in there and like, They'll, they'll make a, a cheap movie that'll look great and they'll seize a chunk of the box office. So that's the one thing. The other thing though, and very important from the point of view of any Chinese filmmaker that aspires to have their movie you know, go overseas, is that if you don't own the intellectual property, you don't protect the intellectual property, and you don't have everything you need in terms of finance, insurance, chain of title, proper contracts with cast and crew. Even if you can get your film released in mainland China, it will not be able to be taken by people outside of mainland China because their own legal procedures and requirements will not allow them to buy the picture. So we do spend a lot of time working with our partners in China to educate them about, well, for the production management to educate people about what is the value of a completion bond, what is the value in the distribution process of having collection accounts, and then what is the value of having errors and omissions insurance, and all of these things which will set them up for more success later on when they take their films 
outside or when we help them take the films outside. So these are the things that are, they cause a lot of headache, but somebody has to do them. And right now I agree with Nansen, it's a little bit chaotic because there's so much money sloshing around in the Chinese film industry. And there's always somebody who's willing to step in and go, don't tell me about these problems, I just want to give somebody money to make a movie because, because I have money. And then the somebody, who may be an inexperienced director, will take the money. But they may regret it later on, because if the first movie they make is a disaster, they may not have a chance to make a second movie. And so what we try to, when we're working with young directors, we try to encourage them to try to do things right and to work with people that they can trust, because that ultimately put them on a good career path and they won't just be like a one-time wonder if they have you know, a movie or, or a one-time disaster, in which case they will not have another movie. I think a couple of years back I heard uh, quite a few anecdotes about these um, new financiers coming onto the scene in mainland China, um, what we call the Melaba, the, 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 the owners of coal mines, who favor themselves to be the new um, film mogul in China, that they will actually finance films, but they don't really have the expertise about, well, actually what a production of film of a film actually entails. So do you think the situation has changed from a few years back when these financiers would actually bring money to the sets and then open the car trunk and there are all these cash um, given, given out to like the crew for, for the daily expenses? That seems to be quite primitive, but things have changed somewhat, uh, hasn't it? I mean, um, no, there's actually like a new Mei Laoban every day in China, you know? and and and. The worst, the, the most dis sort of discouraging thing for us is when we, we meet a really talented young scriptwriter or a director and we say, hey, we'd like to work with you on your movie. And they say, it doesn't matter. I got this, you know, this rich guy who's already given me all the money. They start working on it six months later. They, they come back to us and they say, oh, actually, he never came up with the money. Can you help? And by then it may be too late for us to help because they may already have a half-completed bad movie. If, there's, if they haven't actually started, yes, we can help. Um, but I do think that you know, this is going to continue for as long as people um, have so much money in China. But I think that what you're seeing right now is that companies like Bona and Huayi Brothers and Enlight Media and La Vision um, Beijing New Classics Pictures, Wanda are pulling away from the rest of the pack because when you actually have a business that involves movies and you're not just doing it as a novelty project or a vanity project and you're responsible for marketing it, distributing it, getting it into cinemas and developing ancillary revenue streams from that movie, you will be more responsible. And so I think that ultimately there will be about five or six really strong Chinese film companies and some very strong international players who are deeply embedded in the Chinese film industries who will just pull away from everyone else. I don't know if Nansen, if you agree with that. Uh, actually, I think... Um, I think, I don't even know how to tell you how much of what Helen's saying is exactly what I wanted to say, because that we are really living it every day. Um, just in response to several things she said, I think one, I'm in a way very pleased if there are more international players coming to work in China, because that would help build a healthy infrastructure. Uh, in terms of the Mei Lao Ban, it's true, there's a medicine Lao Ban, and a wine Lao Ban, a tobacco Lao Ban, you know, all kinds of Lao Bans. Um, in fact, somebody wanted to put uh, money in in one of my films. It's funny for people who try to look for money outside because in China there's so much money you have to turn people down and people get very upset and you have to give face because one guy I had to turn down was a friend's friend who said please, please let him come in. He really wants to. He owns a foot massage chain. <laughs> so I don't want my film to say presented by blah blah foot massage. I have nothing against, those, against foot massage but it's just, you know. So th this will continue for a long, long time. I keep telling people, 
you know, money is one of the issues only, but you must consider the other elements. As, as uh, for other people approach me, I, I rarely talk to people I don't know now, because it's just too painful. It's very time consuming to try and find an understanding, a basis, a premise for your exchange of um, ideas or values, you know. My beautiful is not your beautiful, and as we take forever to find out, you know. And I say, money is one thing. Second is, do you have a property I need to work with? If you have a great novel, or book or something that I need to work with, I will consider working with you. Or do you have some kind of platform, like you have a, your TV station, your marketing abilities or something? And fourth is still our relationship, our understanding. Because anybody who works with know, if you work something you have a good understanding with, not necessarily agree with, you know, to know what, when I say A, it's an A that you and I recognize, that saves you a lot of time, makes it much more efficient. And, and, and I have lots of stories like Alan's too, where young film, because, and you say, well, I need, you still need to work on the script, and before you know it, he said, oh, I've got somebody I'm shooting already, and then a few months later, he comes back and said, can you save me and get me out of this, you know? Um, and on the other side, a very good friend, who's a very rich man in China, and one day he says to me, very happily, oh, good, I've signed up, let's say, Alan, I've signed Alan as my next film's director. Oh, so that's congratulations, very good, Ellen's a very good director. Good, now I can tell her I don't like the script, I'm going to change it. And I don't like the leading act actress, I'm going to change her too. I said, why don't you tell her before you sign? Well, if I tell her, she's not going to sign, right? <laughs> you see, there are so many of these, you know, the, the understanding of the respecting a contract and things like that. And we have hundreds of stories like that. So in answer to Clarence's uh, question, if you want to work in China, and I welcome everybody to work in China, it will be a very interesting experience for all of you, whoever goes. <laughs> Most important, find the right partner. And exactly as Ellen said, I think the two uh, are most uh, uh, experienced or who has been in the game the longest in co-production are the obvious party brothers and Bona, other than the state studios, of course. State do studios, working with them is another seminar, so let's do that another time. <laughs> But working with, I think, uh, it, it's easier still to work with privately held companies. So, so Bona and, 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 and Huaya have been at it for over 10 years. So they have a lot more uh, experience in that sense and have a better sense of how to work with outside parties. Um, uh, after that, our companies have been around for, let's say, six, seven, eight years, like Enlight, Ali, Galloping Horse, and this sort. And after that, a whole bunch of other new companies, too. Um, and, and these companies, well, I think those in the front end who's been working the longest, uh, I think they'll be working in this business in another 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Whereas the very new companies, you don't know whether it's just flavor of the month, you know, that they find, oh, you know, this is a hot area, then let's get into it. And then after a while, they find they don't like it. I've seen companies come and go in the last 10 years very quickly. It's not for the lack of money. So when you go to work with China and looking for a partner, for somebody to say they have lots of money doesn't mean a thing. There are many, many people with lots and lots of money. That's not the important part. It's more the expertise, the understanding of film, their commitment to making a good film, their expertise in marketing, in distribution, in collection. I mean, collecting money is a big art in China too, right? So I think that partner is your most important uh, thing. And if you, you must come with something. Um, coming with expertise um, which the Chinese partner will understand. When you say, well, you know, we're very good lawyers, we have very good agreements, it doesn't really matter because it doesn't think, he doesn't think it's very important, although we know it's very important. If you say, oh, I have, I will bring you Tom Cruise, then he will think it's very important. And maybe you can um, share with us some of your experiences on Tiny Times because um, Nancy just mentioned the importance of partnership. I think Tiny Times is a, a very good example of how um, film companies could also strike up uh, fruitful relationships with uh, partners from beyond the film industry. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about Xiao uh, Shidai, the 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 production of the film and how how you helped uh, Guo Jingming a very young director, although a very established author, but a first-time director, how to realize his vision on screen. Uh, 
呃，就这个问题，其实我也想补充一下刚才那个石老师和艾伦女士的一些话。呃，我觉得就是在中国拍电影呢，呃，不管是呃创作者或者导演啊、呃，或者投资。呃，我觉得就是呃，应该是上中下游吧。我觉得就是如果投资人呃，他要想做电影的话，我觉得他不是找到一个导演就对了。他因为他不懂这个行业，那他应该找什么人呢？他其实应该找一个呃专业的制片公司或者专业的电影制片人。那么导演也一样。或者那个创作团队也一样，他就是中间一定要找到这样的专业的制片公司或者制片专业的制片人，来让用这个桥梁来挡住一些不必要的干扰。啊，比如说像刚才施老师讲的，哦，他跟你很多人，他去给你钱给你，但是他什么都不懂，你没有办法跟他交流，你的艺术观点、你的创作理念，他都不认同。其实对这个呢，他光拿钱来对创作是极大的伤害。呃，那那我觉得。如果说那个呃有了这样的制作人或者制片公司，他其实可以上边他可以给你进行营销和宣传和海外国国内国外的发行，那么下边呢，他可以保障整个创作团队不受外界的干扰。啊，这样呢起到一个挡风墙的作用。那其实我我拿我来讲，跟那个郭敬明的合作，呃呃，《小时代呢》呢是今年特别受关注的一个电影，而且话题啊特别强，应该是夏天最大的一个话题。呃，它之所以引起这样的这么大的关注，一个是郭敬明导演本身的影响力，呃，再有一个就是他自己的那个小说的销量在中国非常的广泛。啊，那么一个作家当导演，呃，是一个特别受关注的一个事件。很多人会觉得，呃，他作家能拍出什么样的电影？哦、呃，那他这个，呃，作家的电影会是什么样子？是是好不好？那那真的引起了很大的一个讨论。那所以，在我我们在整个的制作过程中，其实我知道一个新导演来做一部电影，他需要什么？就是他对电影的技术、电影的创作的一些手法，各方面都不是很成熟。那么我们需要作为制片人，其实需要给他。呃，配备一个就帮他来实现他的电影梦，那就帮他配备专业的团队，比如说专业的摄影、专业的美术，呃，专业的造型和包括那个监制啊、呃，就是能够在现场呃帮到他所有的技术环节，让他自己呃当导演的部分呢，让他把自己的这种表达的理念和他的这种。呃，想想传达的这种价值观，其实放到电影里面去，呃，这样的话，其实能够让一个新导演迅速的去融入整个的主创团队，来达到他想要的高度，啊、呃，这是从创作方面。那么从呃营销和整个的发行各方面呢，其实我们呃融合了国内很多的优秀的力量。呃，包括呃，我们的宣传团队就是麦特文化，然后我们的发行团队就是乐视影业，呃，然后我们包括我们自己的公司大胜国际，我们从营销、植入、宣传、发行和新媒体，呃，各个层面保驾这样一个电影的宣传的到达，啊、呃，所以呢，就是每一个每一个点其实都是呃要做到到位。都要覆盖到，呃，应该说是起到了一个非常好的效果，呃，应该呃，我们动员了所有我们能动员的力量，放到这样的一个电影里，在常规宣传的同时，其实也也做了很多一些突破和创新，怎么样去跟？呃，他郭敬明的粉丝最广泛的去接触，最广泛的去带领，那。真的是郭敬明自己本身也发挥了很大的作用，呃，比如说一般的电影，可能就会呃有有三支预告片，就可能是最了不起了。然后然后有三款到五款海报，可能也是
最多了。那么我们这部电影其实做了有一百多款海报，那它这一百多款海报不是就是为了在最后上电影的时候放到影院的，呃，而这一百多款海报是我们从一开机。到上映，整个这九个月的时间里，我们每周会定期的发布。我我当时讲了一句话，就是说，因为郭敬明的特点、郭敬明的影响力和这本书的作用，啊、呃，我我们说创造一个用海报讲故事，啊、呃，就是在电影没有上映之前，透过我们的宣传物料，用海报最典型的透露出我们整个电影的气质，整个电影想传达的内容。呃呃，然后呢，又又做了有十几款的那种呃视频制作特技，呃，定期的去发送到呃各个群体，呃，应该说真的起到了特别好的作用啊。那所以说，整个一部电影呢，就是未来一部电影成功越来越不是单个个体的成功，应该是。特别多的全体团队协作的力量，说有一个呃呃，说其实往往很多很多的那个导演就是特别有有有自我追求、自我呃那种主控观念的导演，可能在未来可能更容易失败，因为什么呢？其实他呃他听不进别人的意见，他听不到别人的。呃，创新的一些想法，他一意孤行的时候，其实往往是市场他被市场抛弃的时候。因为我们的观众，呃，各个层面都有，呃，所以呢，就是说，我们身边不管是我们的工作人员还是我们的主创，他都是我们观众的一份子。他的发言，他的他的一些意见，可能都反反来反映观众的真实的一些想法。所以我们会更注重跟。各个群体、各个观众身边的人的交流，然后我还想补充，就是呃，好莱坞电影的呃制片人的概念，可能跟我们内地呢就有点区别，就是中国内地电影呢制片人，就是好莱坞电影制片人呢。可能就到中国就分成了两部分，他的两个他的职能被两部分来组，有两部分来组成，一个是。呃，我们所说的监制，就像石老师，啊、呃，然后再有一个就是制制片人，可能就像我，这样两个功能结合在一起，成他他才是好莱坞的那个制片人的概念。就是像石老师呢，那么多年的创作经验，他对一部电影的成功，对一部电影主那个品质的把握，呃呃，和整个的那个主创人员的选择，都是对一部电影至关重要的。呃，对于电影的创作方向，他给的把控啊，也是他能做的。这是我们中国概念的这个监制的概念啊、呃。那制片人，我的制片人的概念是，其实主要是负责运营的，他可能要要呃整合资源，要去投融资，要去呃选选择一些。呃，合作伙伴和和包括导演主创的一些一些搭配，啊、呃，更其实更像一个呃，跟市场比较相关的啊这样的一个一个一个一个一个功能，也可以简单的定为就是说。呃，施老师是卖电影，呃，做电影，我是卖电影，<笑>我们俩结合，可能就是把一个电影能做到极致的一个一个一个保障。所以我就觉得，呃，我们未来可能从就是说从去年年底到今年，呃，中国市场发生了一个变化。我我刚才说的说跟香港电影合作的蜜蜜月期结束，不是。主创人员合作蜜月期的结束，而是呢，就是说，原来由香港电影发起的内容方面啊，呃，一个题材和内容方面的这种发起，可能这样是结束了。那现在的时期是什么呢？是其实主要由内地电影，嗯、呃，内地的题材啊、呃，内地的小说版权啊、呃，所有这样的来发起一个电影的时候，可能未来会越来越多啊、呃，因为。这才是呃反映内地观众的一个需求。Plus ça change, plus ça ne change pas. 
if you, I, I make some films which you know take a long, long time to make. And most of my films take at least one and a half years from the beginning of production to the release. So I've been trained maybe in the way that I never think, oh, this is what's hip now. This is really, really working now. Let me quickly make a fast one. I, I don't know how to do that. I'm not, I just don't know how to do it, you know? So when I'm, I'm making, when I make a film, I think it all sounds very, very cliche, but you know, you do have to find the reason why you make that film in terms of its core value, its core message, is something you do want to say. Now how you say it is how, you know, the, that's the fancy works, you know, the effects, the costume, the whatever. But that value that you, that message that you want to say should be a universal message which works through all times. I think that's what uh, keeps us, uh, keeps, you know, me working for over 30 years in the industry because I always try to find films uh, which, 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 which are like that. I mean, I, I don't find, it's just like, you know, in daily life, I don't find things, I don't want to make a quick quip and that's it. You know, you want to say things which has a meaning, which is a universal, which will find rapport with many people. Um, and that's also my principle in making films. So I don't worry about so sort of not keeping abreast of the time, so to speak. Yeah. We, um, we don't try to look at what's been successful last week and do the same thing, because obviously, if you do that, you'll have a movie coming out 18 months later that will feel very old. Um, what we do is we view ourselves as the audience and we go to every new Chinese movie that comes out, you know, good or bad, whatever. Um, we try to feel what the audience is feeling. And, you know, our, my staff in China, um, apart from me, because I'm older, but they are all very young, and they are all um, movie fanatics to the point where it's almost like they're too sophisticated because they're not necessarily representative of the average audience, but that's okay. We don't try to um, prove to everybody that we can make a movie that everyone in the world is gonna love. We, we figure out, of the Chinese audience, what is the sub-audience that we're aiming for? For example, some movies in China are going to work really well in the uh, big urban centers, but are going to be a little bit too sophisticated for the rest of the country. Some of them are mass general entertainment, like Journey to the West, which, you know, there wasn't anyone in China who wasn't at least interested in concept in seeing that movie. Um, and we just try to know what the audience is for that movie, and then take what's been done before in a similar genre, and basically try to do every element a little better, a little smarter, and a little younger. Because as Amy said, the audience age is dropping. And some of these will be things like, um, almost like new wine in old bottles. Like, you know, we're right now working with, with Bill Kong and his team at Irresistible Pictures on a reboot of the Wang Fei Hong franchise, which all of the actors uh, are young, um, except for Sammo Hong, who plays the big boss guy. And everything about the way the film looks and the action direction, uh, the, the um, special effects and everything will look very new. But it's, it's an old story. It's a story that everybody knows. So it's incremental in that respect, and um, it's not following a fad. It's striving to tell the story as well as it can be told with the best tools that are available to us as producers today. Yeah. 那可能一个好的题材选对了
我们自己本身就生生活在就是在日常的生活中，其实就有本身就有自己的思考，自己的想表达的东西。呃，那首先我们一个是要密切的其实关注。呃，我们去国内的一些政治经济形式，那么这个政治经济形式实际上是让所有的观众或者所有的人来非常关注的一个焦点。那么这些焦点是不是可以产生一个电影？因为毕竟电影呢是生活的表达，那我们能够抓住就是大家所关心的，而且能够引起社会共鸣的。这样的题材，呃，能够抓到，我觉得就是就非常容易成功了。因为我呢，就是做电影的时候，我有一个理念，呃，就是你不要首先你不要向观众解释你这个电影是什么。那么，首先你拿到这个观众不是拿到这个电影名字的时候，让观众第一反应就是说用五秒钟来反应，想不想看这个电影？呃，嗯，这个电影是说什么的？是什么题材？其实都反映在这一个电影的片名中。那么我就觉得，如果他的第一直觉就非常喜欢，那么我们会就会放大这种效应，在整个电影的拍摄和上映前的这一年到一年。到十八个月的这样的时间里，我们放大这种期待，放大这种好奇，呃，抓住这一点，其实让观众走进影院来看你的电影，呃，这是我一直做电影的一个观点，就是当你如何的你去跟拿了一个电影，观众不知所云，你还要去讲我这个电影是什么是什么，然后是表达什么呢？其实你已经失败了。你再怎么努力，可能都不会成功。那这是我我的一个观点。另外一个呢，就是呃，我在选择电影的时候，就是我我们公司的员工大大部分都是二三十岁的年轻人，而且呢，我自己有一个十七岁的儿子，呃，我会跟他们密切的交流，我会时刻的去关注他们喜欢的和他们在干什么，呃，这样的这样的呃。结果实际上其实是代表了一种趋势的，你能够抓住这个趋势，呃，你把它变成电影，我觉得成功率也还是很大的。那么另外一个呢，就是说我自己，就是我们自己生活中遇到的一些困惑，或者遇到的一些呃不能解决的问题，那我们会在想，这些是不是也是其他人遇到的和想解决的东西？如果我们思考的结果说应该是的。那我们也会把这样的题材内容去把它做成一部电影来表达出来，呃，这是我我我我作为制片人来选择题材的几个原则，啊，嗯、呃，所以呢，就是，呃，如果说身边的人都不喜欢，我是绝对不会做的，啊，我就是这样的，谢谢。Since we are talking about tapping the public pulse, probably it's a good time. To tap the pulse here among the audience, so maybe we can open the discussion to the floor and see whether there are questions that you will want to ask our speakers. And I think with the system that we have in in place, maybe you can just、um, email in your questions or to the、um, the site. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we have at least three questions. So maybe we shall look at the first question.、Um, the first question is: What's the trend in ch the Chinese film industry? Is it focusing on domestic market or trying to go international? Okay, okay maybe. Okay, please.、Um. The trend in the Chinese film industry, from the people who are investing in and distributing and marketing movies, is to focus on the domestic market because the domestic market is booming. It's the second largest box office in the world outside of North America. And you know, a few years ago, when the Chinese box office was not as valuable,、um, but filmmakers had higher ambitions and they wanted to make bigger budget movies, they kept trying to figure out how they could. Make their movies international, but a lot of filmmakers in China realize that you know they need to make good movies first that work with the Chinese audience and to really mine the 
unexploited potential of the Chinese marketplace. And now I think that that's been a very healthy process. Now some of these movies, as we all discussed today, the ones with better production values and universal storytelling techniques will in fact go overseas, but that's more of an organic development than it is something that you can force. To, 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 to follow up on this question from a member, of the member of the audience, do you think actually filmmakers these days in China, in, on mainland China, do they actually care about uh, an international breakthrough through of sorts? Or since the Chinese market is so self-sustainable, do they really care about whether the films could travel? I think any filmmaker wants any one additional person to watch their film is one better. I mean, any French filmmaker would want, even if he's very successful in France, or Italian filmmaker, even if it's the most popular, would want more audience. And I think always for a non-English language or non-Hollywood style movie to do well internationally is of great pride to that filmmaker or that country. Do you want to add to it? 我我我觉得，嗯，作为中国电影，首先应该立足于本土，呃，然后才能再走向国际。如果说你拍的电影在你自己的国家、你自己的人民都不喜欢看，那你怎么可能去影响其他地域的人民？其实，我觉得这是是这是理所当然的啊。那另外呢，就是，呃，那个自己的那个市场。能够先让你呃，作为一个制片公司，先能收回成本，让你生存，啊，你你你能够生存，你才能去再去想办法啊，去让你的那个电影去影响更多的人，啊，我我我我的观点是这样的，谢谢。Okay, maybe we will have a look at the second question. ฉันไม่แน่ใจว่าฉันจะพูดถึงเรื่องนี้ได้ไหมแต่ฉันคิดว่าเราไม่ต้องการที่จะเป็นนักแสดงที่ดีมากๆฉันคิดว่าเราไ
，呃，还有施老师监制的这个《龙门飞甲》哦哦，那个《狄仁杰》啊，《狄仁杰》系列应该算也就这么两三部电影是魔幻题材的，但这几部电影的票房都非常成功。那么也就是说，呃，这是中国观众。呃，看的比较少的，而且也比较喜欢的一个类型。那中国电影未来的大片在哪里？我想应该在这里。而且呢，这个这种类型的电影是没有没有历史的，没有国界的，它是很有可能，呃，真的能够走向国际的一个片种。所以这个也是我们未来的一个方向。正好我自己也正在制作这样一部电影，就是《钟馗伏魔》。啊啊！我希望能够通过这样的电影，在技术上靠近好莱坞，呃，在这个这个故事的讲的方式，呃，能够有一些呃全球通行的一些语言，然后能够到达更多的观众。当然，我还会立足于中国本土的观众，先让他们接纳，最终再再去影响其他人。谢谢。Thank you, Anne. Um, I think uh, it's about time that we are to wrap up. So um, I would like to thank our panelists, our speakers, Nansen, Alan, and Anne. Thank you for your very valuable experiences that you shared with us, and thank you all for coming.